Right, thank you everybody for coming to this evening's lecture looking at black history in Islam. And there's going to be a few approaches which I intend to use in order to bring home the, the essence, the true understanding and the comprehension of what it means to understand black history in Islam. Because black history in Islam is actually from the beginning, it's from its inception. It's not where the people of people from East Africa or from Abyssinia end up going into the Rain Peninsula and then maybe getting in contact with Arabs and developing themselves. The Arabs at this particular time in the time were actually black people or black people. And I think this is something I'm going to lay the foundation in in order for you to have an understand of what type of demography lived in the Rain Peninsula on how things started to change and diffuse with elements of gene flow, where Persians were mixing with darker skinned Arabs to make them slightly lighter, Kurdish people, Romans, Greeks, Slavic people, Germanic people, etc. So this is what the presentation will focus on. And later on in the presentation, I'm going to look at the Moorish period within Spain. And I think this is important because what has taken place with the 781 years to 800 years of Muslim contribution, achievement and accomplishment in Spain, the African presence or the black presence have literally been written out. And I'm going to lay some basic principle foundations of trying to understand the contributions that African people have made. When other people have come into Islam, they've been recognized by their ethnicity. So they will look at the Ottomans, the Turks, they will look at the Ayyubids who were Kurds. But for some reason, when it comes to black dynasties, etc., they either like to whitewash it over or they like to deny or attribute it to someone else. And unfortunately, this doesn't just take place within European history. It also takes place amongst within the Muslim community as well. So if you can change the slide for me. Right, these are just some of the books which I've got some of my information from. So the book on the left hand side at the top, uh, The Virtues of the Blacks and the Abyssinians, that was written in the 12th century by Ibn al-Josi. And I'll go a bit more into that. At the bottom, there's Illuminating the Darkness, which was written by Habib, uh, Habib Akande. I think he's from London, a young historian who's doing his little bit in order to bring the black element within the Islamic perspective, back to its roots, back to its beginning. If you look at the top middle, Al-Jahid, okay, the book of the glory of the blacks, he was a ninth century scholar. He was a black Arab that lived in Mesopotamia or Iraq at that time. He had published between 200 and 250 books. And this is something I think is important to know of looking at his contribution to the literature that took place at that particular period. And the reason why he wrote this book was because the element of discrimination to some extent was taking place in Iraq amongst towards darker skinned Arabs. OK, darker skinned Arabs. This is really important here, not Africans that migrated there. OK. The next one is Nature Knows No Color Line. That's written by a Jamaican. His name is uh, Joel Rogers. He wrote this book, I think it was in the 1930s, 1930s and 40s. And he basically looks at the history of black people and he's got a massive chapter in there looking at the contributions, the achievements and the accomplishments that black people had brought to Islam from its, from its inception, right up until obviously the, the 20th century. Then Century in Black, black Narrative, that was a book that's only come out in the last couple couple years. That's looking at the African presence or the black presence in Islam, in the Quran, in the Hadith, etc. And actually showing the Sahabas who were black skinned Arabs that was living around the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And then the last book, which is on the right bottom hand side, that's looking at Black Arabia. And that's looking before Arabia became mixed with Indo-European groups and making them lighter skinned. And this, basically the author of this, Wesley Muhammad, literally deals with the primary sources. And obviously what he does, he translates those primary sources into understanding how dark the Arabs were at that particular time. Next slide, please. OK, so here you'll find that if you look at the top left, you'll find this is a Yemeni Arab. And on the right hand side, you can see that black and white photo. This was taken just before or just after World War One. This is the Saud family. OK, the Saud family of Saudi Arabia. Ibn Saud is in that picture. 
I think if my memory serves me right, he's on the left-hand side with the beads on his lap. So if you look at the skin color of the Arabs at that particular time, you can see how dark they were. So it is important for us to understand the racial composition of the Arabs, even, even when we come in into the 20th century. Because if you look at the bottom, this is a type of advertisement or marketing ploy which is done in order to say that these are the Arabs today, which are much lighter skinned. And unfortunately, what has happened is because people live in the so-called Gulf states, Middle East, and they're much lighter, they just assume that this is how, this was the color composition of Arabs back in antiquity. And this is just, this is just not true. This is Indo-European skin color. So what has happened when the Muslims went into particular areas, they started to mix with the Greco-Roman people, they started to mix with Slavic people, Germanic people, yeah, they started to mix with Kurds and Afghanis and people from the Indian so-called subcontinent. And I say sub uh, so-called because I don't like to use the word sub because the word sub is for subhuman or subordinates. OK, so I think this is, this is really important for us to understand because a lot of people from the Middle East are doing DNA now and many of them are beginning to realize they're not even Arab. They don't even have the Arab DNA. OK, so this goes to show that what has happened is that they've embraced Arabic as a language and the Arabic culture. Because there's four, there's three different types of classifications that Muslim scholars have used over the years to describe Arabs. So you've got the Al-Arab Al-Ba'idah, the ones which don't exist no more. That was like uh, um, Ad and Thamud and Jaldis, you know, um, certain groups, certain groups of people which don't exist no more. OK, they came from the southern part of Arabia. Then you've got the Al-Arab Al-Ariba, okay, the true or the pure Arab. And these are the darker skin. These are the original types. And then the latter one, the Musta Ariba. Now, the Musta Ariba, your mulatto, your mixed types. They come around about the time of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and the kind of mixtures which was coming in even after that. So they're known as the Musta Ariba. And they are the children and the, and the matriarch of the Musta Ariba is Hagar or Hajar. She was Nubian, she's the mother of Ismail, alayhi salam, and she was also the wife of Ibrahim, alayhi salam, as well. So this is important to know. So the mother of the Arabs, of the Musta Ariba, was a Nubian black woman who came out of Egypt, who was the wife, or in this case, the second wife of Ibrahim, alayhi salam. So it's trying to understand the racial composition that when Islam spread, it brought in other groups of people and caused what, what caused admixture or what, genetic, or what geneticists would call gene flow. Next slide, please. Right, this is Asa Iliad. He's a chemitologist or chemitologist. Basically, he studies ancient Egypt when ancient Egypt was black or African. That's what chemitologist is, because that is the name of the country that Egyptians, that's what they call their country. They didn't call it Egypt. They call it Kemet. Egypt is a Greek word which came into existence around about 332 BC when Alexander of Macedonia came in after defeating the Persians and took over Egypt as part of the Greco-Roman uh, province. He's also a historian and an educational psychologist. And this is what he's saying to black people in the Western world. There is something dreadfully wrong with an education socialization process that leaves us ignorant of our past, strangers to our people and apes of our oppressors and creators of habitual, shallow thought and trivial values. So there's a couple of things I want to emphasize here. The education socialization is something that is really important here, where we learn our information from. So you've got the educational system and the socialization process is what takes place at the home. So for those people who are, from, who are not within the African or from the black experience, this is where I bring you into this now. OK, so if you are educated and socialized in a particular manner, you will be ignorant of your past. And this is a problem now, OK, where many people deny, you know, the black Arab experience because majority of the people in the Arab speaking world are light skin or fair. OK, so it's important for us to go back to the primary sources because the primary sources are actually there. So, it, so for you is to understand that if you're not educated properly or socialized properly in the process of socialization, this will leave you ignorant of your past and even strangers to your people. And what DNA is actually saying now that many of you do not come from that band. 
So there needs to be more investigation of how Islam spread into those regions and how different groups of people came in and became Arabized. And Arabization is basically where people adopt the culture and the language, not necessarily the genes or the genetic or the phenotype or the genotype. This is what's important here, because more and more Middle Easterners and more and more people from the Gulf states are doing these DNA tests and finding out that their roots is in places like Northern, like in Germany, in Northern Europe. They find out their genes in Central Asia. It's not even in the Arabian Peninsula. So this is the ignorance of people understanding the history of what has taken place in those regions over 1400 years. Next slide, please. So here, Asa Iliad goes on to say that this is what has happened with history. So history has gone through three things when, it, when we went through colonization. So after 1492, when the Moors or the Africans within Andalusia or Spain lost that territory, Europeans have gone on a way to ensure there was five basic principles that they brought into existence to ensure that there would be some element of disassociation or disconnection of black people acknowledging and understanding their contributions, achievements and accomplishments to human society or mankind. So when they did, they tried to destroy it. When they couldn't destroy it, they distorted it. So let's just take things from an ancient Egyptian perspective. When they couldn't destroy the information or whatever the case may be, they decided to distort it. By distorting it, they were breaking off the noses to try to disfigure the Africanity of who the ancient Kemites or Egyptians were. I'm just giving you an example. When they couldn't do that, they would suppress that information. If you really want to know the real information of black history, when you go to museums, they are in the basement, okay, hidden from public eye. They're not on display. If you really want to see the true museum and the contributions and achievements and accomplishments of black people or dark-skinned people from antiquity right up to the modern times, go in the basements. That's where the information is. OK, so that's to suppress information. Then they tried to falsify. They're trying to reinterpret what the ancient Kemites said about who they were. They had no problems acknowledging they were dark skinned. They traded with people south of their border in places like Nubia, which is today Sudan, even in North Africa. They had no problems with this. But modern Eurocentrics do. And then the last thing is to intentionally confuse. And these are the five, five basic principles that Europeans have used in order to destroy the African past. Because unfortunately, we're living in a time now whereby they focus on slavery. And it's now it's become a global phenomenon. Now, black history has been going on for four weeks now. And write in your box, communicate with each other. Have you seen any positive images of black people in the last four weeks? Ancient Egypt, ancient Nubia, ancient Sumeria. Have you seen any of these on your TVs? Just answer yes or no. And then once you've done that, ask the second question. Let me ask the second question. Have you seen anything connected with black history in the last four weeks associated with slavery? And this is just an example of showing you what Asa Iliad is saying. They want to keep us in this 500 room box. And unfortunately, many Muslims are caught up with this reality as well as keeping black people in this box of being subordinate or being slaves. We're the oldest people on the planet. If you've been there from the very beginning. And the fact of the matter is, is that there's a particular portion of history that people like to focus on to make themselves feel good, unfortunately. And that's been inherited you know, pervasively sometimes or usually by their children and grandchildren and great grandchildren until we are where we are at the present moment in time. So did anybody, so let's have a look at some of these chats here just to get the ball rolling, just to see what any of you said. Mostly slavery, yes, no, yes, no, not specifically. Uh, I'm getting a bit tired now, specifically. Right. OK, so some of you have answered those questions. So this is just showing you the reality of what Asa Iliad is saying. Next slide, please. Right. This is a derogatory image of colonization. This is drawn by the French. 
Okay, we're going to look at scientific colonialism, where Afrocentrism in the 1960s and 70s decided to debunk some of the things that was taking place within the academies in the Western world. And you can see there how they have tried to manipulate and joke about the African bodies. You can see a black woman then, unfortunately, for being graphic, but you sometimes you need to see these images where the buttocks is sticking out and there's a white child sat neatly on the buttocks. This is the image that was coming out of Europe at that time, because there was a fascination amongst white women to have dark-skinned women's behinds, just like it is now. The lips of, of dark-skinned people and the behinds of dark-skinned people has now become the major fashion statement in beauty and aesthetics around the world now. But unfortunately, when we had it, and we have it naturally, it was referred to as baboon backsides and rubber lips. Now it's within the white realm. It is about having voluptuous lips and it's also having a nice booty, you know. The words has changed. It's still the same, but they changed the words and changed the narrative. Or it's now it's called a, a Brazilian behind, you know. When majority of the Africans that live outside Africa, the largest country of black people is Nigeria, okay, in Africa. And then outside Africa, the largest black population outside Africa is Brazil. But when they talk about the Brazilian, but they ain't talking about the Africans in Brazil. They're talking about the mulatto mixed type, which has inherited the black genetic genes from the mothers into them, but they have lighter skin. This is what has happened. So scientific colonialism has three objectives. So the first one is unsophisticated falsification, where they lie about the presence and the contributions of black people. The next one is integrated modification. This is when you take the lie, the truth, the myth, the legend, okay, and you mix it all up together. You modify it on Eurocentric lines. And conceptual incarceration is whereby the group of people are basically locked into that way of thinking. So when you say that, you know, the original allies were dark skin or black, for instance, people have this moment of, of, of trying to question that because they're looking at the contemporary state of their country or the way that the Middle East may be or the Gulf states may be and cannot imagine when it looked different before those lighter skin interlopers and invaders or latecomers came in to mix with that population. And that is what happens. So you tell a lie, you modify it, and then you lock people into that way of thinking. And that is what's happening. Egyptology is one of the main things that falls into this category. Next slide, please. OK, so this is the film, The Message. So I'm going to look at a couple things within this film. And just to show you how movies influence the way we think. OK, so we're going to look at the secrets behind movies and films. We're going to look at it with this movie. Look at the people who are depicted in this movie movie. And let's, let's have a look at some of the falsifications. So when we're looking at the movie industry, for instance, 100% of movies is based upon making money. That's the first thing we need to acknowledge and understand, okay? It's there to make money. The second thing, if we want to look at it, okay, over 90% is strictly entertainment. It's there to entertain you. This is what it's, so it's there to take your money and to entertain you, even if it's garbage. And then less than 10% is based upon educational material. OK, even though there's all different genres, you've got horror, movie, action, you've got all these things, you've got documentaries, history, whatever the case may be, you've got all these different genres. OK, but if you put all those genres together, etc., less than 10 percent is for educational reasons. So what are we allowing to happen to us in our in our minds? So let's have a look at the way in which images on the screen influence. First thing is is um, consumption to, for us to be consumed, be, to be taken. The word consumption was basically used in the medieval period, where groups of people were literally taken by the devil. So to consume, so is to use, so is to view. Okay, this is what it's about. The other aspect is brainwashing. And this is very cleverly done sometimes when we want to try to understand certain things, okay, and we're influenced by that. You know, 9-11, if I say to you terrorists, there's one group of people which comes to mind. If I tell you, if I say to you the most beautiful women in the world, there's only one racial category which falls into your mind. It's, it's because of advertisement, marketing, media, they all play into this and it's reinforced. 
Desensitization is the next thing that happens where you literally have to suspend reality to allow that to come in. So when you see a lot of murders and killings and all these other type of things, they perpetuate stereotypical images and labeling theories within movies. We will just adopt them and adapt to them as if it's true. And then we got negative reinforcement. A negative reinforcement is where you have to suspend reality in order for that to happen. So, for instance, if I was say to you the word Planet of the Apes, if I was to say to many of you, the Planet of the Apes is based upon how white people as early as the 1960s saw black people because of the theory of evolution. Most of you said, well, I'd be off my trolleys to say that. But let's have a look at the reality. Do gorillas, apes, monkeys, chimpanzees, They've had a person in a monkey suit just walk across the screen. Here is that when the movie was completed and done, it had group. So in Cairo, Al Hazhar, um, film said it was fine it was authentic to One is going to so here you find that.
Islamic history also begins the experience of black people as being slaves. So just like what a Muslim to name only five black characters, five black individuals from Islam, they would literally struggle. But they So there I say, although white or pale, starting slavery, but when you don't know your history, you don't know your past, and you've been given these little Issues based upon differences. Why is it pe why is it hard to believe that people His impression is a white skinned person. Information, they're destroying information, they're destroying.
who were Christian, Hindu, Buddhist, etc. There's another way. Different people of different color who are both British. So like Sumeya, who is described as black, her son So how come I came to that conclusion? They were non-Muslims. This is before they had a mon. And to unwind all this now, okay? Okay, his nephew was Okba ibn Af. the uh, Zayd ibn Harith or Haritha, the adopter.
And these are just another group of people. Okay? It's full, the Quran is full of all different black characters, different black tribes, different black groups of all types. Okay, Bani Israel is a prime example, which I haven't got there. So Adam, Idris, or Enoch, or Enosh, Musa alayhi salam, or Moses, Fir'aun. Musa and Fir'aun is the most mentioned, it's the most mentioned story in the Quran. Two dark-skinned people are the most mentioned story in the Quran, which means that the most mentioned country is an African country, which is Egypt. When they couldn't take Africans out of Egypt, they wanted to move Egypt, uh, um, Egypt into the Middle East. This is what they did, okay? But the Nile is not in the Middle East. The Middle East is a concoction that came at the turn of the 20th century at the Sykes and the Peacock Agreement, when they were dividing up the Ottoman Empire. This is how that came into being. It doesn't exist. You can't take a couple countries out of a continent, put it near the peninsula, and then in Asia, you add that into, it doesn't make sense. So how can Egypt be in the Middle East when the Nile is not in the Middle East? The Nile is in Africa, it's the longest river. So even geography is being distorted now. Do you know in schools today, they actually teach that Europe is a continent when Europe is not even a continent? A continent is a large body of land surrounded by ocean. Europe is not surrounded by ocean, Asia is. Europe is Western Asia on West, Northwestern Asia, but that is what's being taught. So when you take over power, what starts to happen, you can distort the reality and then you can teach it to the next generation until it becomes a fact. Like how many of you believe that the people of Planet of the Apes that gorillas and monkeys speak because it happens on movies, but we know that they're talking about people. This is, the, this is suspending reality being desensitized to the truth of what's really happening. We should not allow our senses to be seduced. Next slide, please. So Ibn al Josi, who's a great scholar in Islam, in the 12th, uh, in the 13th century, he decides to write this book, The Virtues of the Blacks and Abyssinians. And this is what he says, I bear witness to a group of eminent Habashis or Abyssinians who were disheartened due to their dark due to the darkness in skin color. I thus clarify to them that the matter upon which consideration is, pla is, is placed is good deeds rather than one's appearance. And I wrote this book for them to mention the virtues of many from among the Abyssinians and black people. That's the Arabs. That's what he's talking about, the Arabs, the black people. OK, I have divided it into 28 chapters with Allah aid is sought. So his intention was to do it to help the people and his intention was to please Allah. This is what Ibn al Josi did at this time. So there was discrimination in the 13th century at the time when Ibn al Josi was living. Next slide, please. So he goes on to say in his book, Kush Bo, the son of Namrud or Nimrod, the first of the Namarada kings. So the first king of the planet was a black person. It stipulates this in the Judo Christian traditions. Yeah, of the uh, Torah and the Bible. And Ibn al Josi is confirming the Islamic principle or understanding to that. So they all share the same thing in common. The first king on the earth was Namrud or Nimrod, who was a black king. And this is what he says. And he came from Cush. Cush was one of the sons of who? Noah. So it goes on even to say there, okay, um, who ruled 300 years after the flood. Okay, so three years after, 300, 300 years after the flood, this is when he ruled. Okay, it is during this time the earth was divided up, and so subsequently the people began to separate and form into different tribes. So what they're saying here, this was when South America was attached to Africa, the Iberian Peninsula was attached to Africa, and part of the Arabian Peninsula, especially where Yemen is, was attached to Africa. That's what that is basically saying to us. So people was living on the earth and there was land bridges in all these countries before separation started to take place. This is what Ibn al Josi is saying here. The Nimrod or the Nimrod who encountered Ibrahim, alayhi salam, that's Abraham, was from among his sons. And this is the mistake sometimes Christians make, because when Nimrod is mentioned in some places in the Bible, 
facts of incidents, you know, they think it's the same Nimrod. And what Ibn al Josi is saying, no, the name Nimrod was numerous in all different generations. They're two different individuals. The one at the time of Ibrahim alayhi salam is not the same as the person who was the first king of the earth. And this is how many of them got their dating systems wrong. So he also goes on to say that Ham's, because Ham is supposed to be the father of who? He's supposed to be the father of the black race. OK, he says that Ham's children settled in directions of the south and westly winds that Allah put into their complexion. Darkness with a little white. That's what he said that what Allah did. OK, darkness with a little white. Black people all around the world got that little bit of whiteness on the palms of their hands and the soles of their feet. OK, and they occupy the majority of the earth. So the majority of the earth that these asking people are, um, occupied were so numerous. This is what this is saying. Genetics has said the same thing as well. So this person is saying, OK, this Ibn al Jose is saying what geneticists are now saying. That's how far ahead these people were in trying to understand the text understanding the language, understanding the meaning and the oral traditions which were passed down, along with the manuscripts that they were interpreting and reading. Next slide, please. So here, there's just an example. to a location not in Africa. Sometimes Kush when it's Don't have to run through all these now. So these are looking at, if you look at the right hand side here, the Minian civilization that came in, so the first civilization which came to the Rain Peninsula was 1500 BCE. The Sabians, even though they say 700 BCE, okay, I'm going to go 200 years before that. That's why I've got it in green. And this is a time of when we're looking at Bilqis or Makeda or the Queen of Sheba. OK, so it's about 200 years. So most historians make the mistake with the datings. So when you look at the, the dates and when you look at the Bilqis, that civilization came in before. The Himyarites, they're mentioned in the Quran, in Surat al Burush. OK, they're mentioning that. So you've got another dark skinned Arab group of people who are mixed with Kush Arab Kushitic people who are mixed because they were mixing with one another. OK, that lived in that particular region. Then the Abyssinians, they started off their empire basically in Arabia and then they spread into, okay, East, East Africa. 
And then we come to the thing of the Arabs of our time. This is generally about the time of, the, you know, before the time of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and then later on. So that's how that works. Arabia was a matrilineal or matriarchal culture, which goes to show that the Kushites were very matriarchal. Lineage literally came through the mother, even though they focused on the father when it came to leadership, etc. So you can see a commonality with cultures. Even though they diffused and moved out, there's still some element of commonality. Next one, please. So I'm just going to run through these and just to emphasize, you know, who the Sumerians were, etc. Just to put this on the map, the, the Sumerians, the first civilization is known to be Sumer. The first king was supposed to be Namrud or Nimrod. So we now know who the Sumerians were. OK, so even though Sumeriologists are trying to say, well, we know that the language was, was not Semitic. It was not Indo-European. So when we ask, well, what language was it? Oh, we don't know. Only at least one other language group. And this is what they do. OK, and because many of them have got straight nose phenotypes, etc., they just assume that they're not dark skinned people. Majority of the people in Africa do not have broad noses like me. That's a type of nose. The majority of the people in Africa have straight noses. So straight nose is not a European nose. It's the nose that the Europeans inherited off their progenitors when they mutated, OK, and settled in other regions. That's how that came about. OK, so next one, please. OK, so this is just talking about Sumo and Kish. Kish is, is a concoction of Kush. OK, so you're seeing this relationship taking place now. So what Ibn al Jozi is basically laying out, you know, really at the beginning, you know, 300 years after the flood of Nuh alayhi salam. This is how this is all coming together now. Next one, please. And then you've got the Hindu Kush mountains. OK, this part of India, this is near Afghanistan. So, you know, this is just to show you how numerous these groups of people were before they split off and then they start to identify with, to become different language groups. Next one, please. OK, so here we are just talking about, you know, the, the you know, the elder civilization of the region was established by the Sumerians. They were de they were designated in the serial Babylonian inscription as black heads or black faced people. OK, so what that means, that's what Sumer means. That's where we get the word summer from, which means heat, dark. That's what it means. Sumeria, Sumer means black heads or dark faced people. Next slide, please. So here are your Semitic groups that lived in Persia before the Persians that we know today in Iran. They got dark skin. They're from the Elamites. OK, so the early Semitic groups would have dark skin as well. So some people look at these images of the Persian Empire they're thinking, well, where did these dark people come from? They were the original people that lived there before the Aryan groups like the Afghanis and the Kurds and the Iranians came down and settled in these regions because Ibn al Jozi already said that those regions were occupied by dark skinned people. So, this is how you're going to see things mixing now. So, when people in the Iran Peninsula or in the Middle East or in the Gulf states are saying, Well, I can't understand why I am not a Middle Easterner, I'm shocked that my DNA doesn't say that. <laughs> And that is because you're the groups of people that came down and you mix with other groups of people who preceded you or came in with you. And that's the reason why. OK, so you are Arab. So most of you or most of us are Arab either through language. OK, or culture or both. OK, not genetics or genes. Next one, please. OK, so this is just images. OK, of ancient Arabs that lived in Syria. OK, ancient Arabs that lived in Syria. This is during this is in the BC period. And you can see the Egyptians depicting them because they traded with them, especially when you're looking at the times of Hatshepsut and so on, because this is when Palestine, Lebanon, Syria was part of what? The ancient Egyptian empire. If you know your history about ancient Kemet, etc., you know that that was part of the Egyptian empire during the time of Bilqis because of what Thutmosis was doing. He went and he conquered all these lands in Asia. I think it was 150, I think it was 150 city states he brought into the realm, Thutmosis. This is during the time of Hatshepsut. 
and they're recording the different groups of people who they see with different languages and different cultures who is ruling their realm so they know how to you know uh treat them next slide please Okay, and this is just an emphasis of the Jewish tribes. You can see that the nose, even though it's straight, it's flared at the bottom. You can see the lips, the, proje the projection of the jaw, and you can see the peppercorn hair and beard. So that's who the original Jews are. So the ones who are living in Israel today, Ashkenazims, they actually come from Russia, from Central Asia. They're not Jews by genes, by genetics. OK, through religion or conversion of the religion or whatever the case may be, even though we know the Zionists are not a religious organization or a religious sect in the sense they're atheist. Yeah. The reality is that they come from somewhere else. They've adopted. Yeah. That ethnicity or identity. They've adopted it. They, they didn't inherit it through genes. Next slide, please. And there again, you can see a similar thing. This is when the Assyrians came in around about the 7th century BC and they had sacked, you know, Palestine and parts of Lebanon and Syria, etc. And they took the Jews out in chains back to Nineveh, which is in northern Iraq. So you can see you have a large black composition living in those areas. They may not be numerous now, but back in antiquity, they were there. OK, this is what's important here. Next one, please. be taken into slaves into Iraq and Indian people. Next slide, please. Where they're on the head of the Sphinx. Yeah. Because historians are saying when the Arabs came over, they destroyed it. According to Convonni, when he was drawing this, the So, and then you've got the B.
Okay, this particular organizer is not going to read through it because of Not native, the indigenous means the original. Okay, then we later we get Turkish blood. And the people who are the indigenous of that country are
the people who were latecomers or interlopers, the, the ethnically Caucasians. So these white people which came to North that and then what he does he whitewashes all the enslave the aboriginal black population okay show this because they've locked us
places like Lebanon, for instance, yeah, and Syria, they're causing this. Yeah, BCE. And Hannibal is a descendant from. fact is that L3 has eminent Europe, Australia, and South America, etc. And L3, your Kukuyu people are your East Africans. And then from N, that's where you get Europe. U5 and U6. That's where they're from. to 200,000 years in Africa, a lot of people That's all it was done. But the, the reality is that all those genetic markers
people really don't understand the game which is being played, even where cyber. historian he says this around 46 bc the evolves and crystallizes, etc. So it's about 600 years that the word more was being used. So it's used on saint of Austria okay but that's uh, another Moors playing chess at the bottom the person on the left majority of the populations were within what you call So let's have a look at Ziryab, okay? So this is a person who was born a slave in Basra, and, or I think it was in Baghdad actually, and uh, he was very close to Harun al-Rashid in a sense, because what happened was he had a master, his name was Hisak, may have, from, may have come from Mosul in Iraq, and he was teaching him music and how to sing. And in the presence of Harun al-Rashid, this Ziria started to sing, and he basically ended up surpassing his master. So his master basically gave him life or death. If you stay in Iraq, I'm going to execute you. So he fled to Al-Andalus, which is Islamic Spain, okay? The Iberian Peninsula, around about 822. So he's there now, and what happens is, the one of the monarchs, the 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 Umayyad monarchs, dies, 
and another one comes. I think it was Abdul Rahman II was the one which was ruling at that time. Okay, so we work profusely to, under, uh, to understand growth of bacteria. So this guy, this individual, is a botanist. So even though he's a slave, there was element of mobility. He was still able to gain some good quality education. And then he was able to basically free himself to a large extent and become upwardly mobile. He was becoming upwardly mobile in Baghdad. And now he's becoming upwardly mobile, and I think he's in the city of Cordoba. He introduced into Europe Ottoman Spring. So these are some of the contributions that Muslims did in Europe. Okay. He was a fashion designer by innovating thick clothes for winter and thin clothes for summer. So people just wore clothes, okay? This was important, people just wore clothes. So this is how he, in his mastery, decided to create something which is unique in order to understand the climatic changes that people, were, people would have been exposed to. He was also a hairdresser creating different types of hairstyles, et cetera, because only one or two hairstyles would have been known at the time. Siab invented the three course meal. That went into the aristocratic circles within Europe. And that was a soup to start, an entree, which, which consisted of either fish or meat, vegetables, and carbohydrates, which would have probably been rice or potatoes, but mainly rice. Okay, that's where the French got their ideas from with free course meal or cotton bleu, cuisine, etc. etc. From this person, this is in the ninth century. Okay, and also he introduced the drinking from glass vessels because the monarchs at that time were drinking from metal um type of goblets etc you know in europe they were drinking from either metal or wooden goblets so this is what he introduced so when we look at glass today it was an african muslim that introduced that into the society we find today okay and eating off leather placemats was also an innovation that came from ziriab so this was a renaissance man even before the renaissance he was finding all different things in order to improve culture and the reason why he came up with the three course meal was to ensure that there'd be less waste because the people would you know the caliphs were throwing away a hell of a lot of food they were having these massive feasts inviting all these people people couldn't eat as much and then all this food is being thrown away and that is what made him come with the three course meal OK, but last but not least, I'm going to finish up on this one, open up for questions. He had brought into Europe the first phase of washing powder, toothpaste, deodorant and soap. And we know how cleansy the Muslims were, you know, by making wudu and pure ritual purification and bathing and washing. And we know about the plagues that was taking place in Europe. And this man saw there, there needed to be some sort of item and object to get the dirt off people so soap powder say for instance in his early stages was using you know uh, salt crystals and they would use rose uh what do you call it i think it's rose water they call it to give the clothes a bit of fragrance this was to try to get the dirt out because most of the majority of the muslims in the iberian peninsula was wearing white okay so when he started to see things he's observing what can i do to improve that situation and this is what he was basically doing. So, um, and the thing which I'll finish off here, that the hair and beauty colleges that you see today, the first one in Europe was opened up in the ninth century by this individual, by the name of Ziriab. So I think I'll finish there. I think we may be going off another half hour. You may want to open up for questions, et cetera. And if I need to go back to some of the slides which I've you know, bounced over, whatever the case may be, I can do that. Or you may be tired, you may want to go. Thank you very much. So Zaz Elliott has a question or a statement saying they'd like to learn more about the migration to Abyssinia. Could you expand on that? A bit? Yeah, I can, I can just touch upon it. You know, the whole point of Abyssinia becoming a place of refuge was because King Negus on the Jashi, he was a pious king. He was considered to be righteous when no man in his country seemed to be wrong. And he was a sort of ruler which would listen to the dispute irrespective of which tradition you came from, which tribe you came from, etc. And through revelations, obviously, uh, that was given to the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And when they were being persecuted at the early stage of Islam, that was the first land of uh, migration. I can't remember the numbers of people which actually went there, but they settled there for the short space of time. And then when the, uh, the torture and the problems actually attenuated or reduced, that's when many of them came back into Mecca. 
And then obviously there was a there was a second migration into Abyssinia as well, because he could have sent them to closer places like, you know, maybe uh, Persia or Rome. But the rulers were not good at that time, you know, so he sent to the best place, you know, to protect them, to preserve Islam. It was, it was the whole point was to save Islam. And this is one of the th reasons why the Prophet had a gentle nature towards Abyssinian people or what they were called Ethiopian people because of their kind nature, you know, uh, and you basically it commanded the followers, you know, to respect these individuals, to respect these people, you know, because they will help you. And then, you know, and to encourage them to come into Islam if there was possible. So I hope I've just touched upon that. And if you want to know more, there's plenty of books where you can read to try to understand that type of relationship. But um, the first thing is, if you're talking about people who became Muslim outside the Rim Peninsula, it would have been in Ethiopia. Okay. Because many of the prophet's tribe, which were considered a hierarchical, you know, um, hierarchical structure, many of them didn't embrace Islam. OK, so I think this is important. So that's where Islam start, begins to spread in East Africa. A lot try to say it starts in Egypt. Other times I like to say North Africa. Other times I like to say West Africa, which came about 150, 200 years later. But actually Islam started spreading when Islam started growing. Not after the death of the prophets. Islam was already in Africa and known in Africa during the lifetime of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And sometimes that is sometimes brushed over, unfortunately, by many historians. Thank you for that. Um, I'm just going to see the questions. Um, yeah, I had a question on, um, you know, every time Brother Abu Bakr, I hear you, I, I learn so much. And now we're seeing a lot of resistance uh, from uh, certain like groups of, of Arabs, like Egyptians are saying we're not Arab, we're Egyptian. Um, the, the, you know, some of the North Africans are saying we're Berbers, we're not Egyptian. And the Sub-Saharan Arabs are saying, you know, we're African, we're not Arab. Yeah. Um, how would you kind of respond to that in, in terms of, uh, you know, are they Arab, are they not Arab? Um, do we, what do we share, what do we, what do we not share? And you touched on, you know, how we're mixed kind of mixed kind of people is, is what defines an Arab. So I'd love to hear your perspective on this. The original Arab originally came from um, from Yemen, OK, from Southern Arabia, and then they actually migrated up, etc. And they started to expand, expand and diffuse into other areas. Now, the thing is, when we look at the Islamic period is for us to understand that not just happen, there's three different types of things we need to understand. There's isolation, migration, and miscegenation. So isolation is where a group of people are the original people that live there. Isolation, then the migration where groups of people come in. Miscegenation is gene flow and mixing. And this is what's happened. So when we're looking at Arab culture, for instance, like I said, okay, but they've adopted Arab culture and, the, you know, mannerisms, et cetera, and language. And that is something for us to understand. But due to colonization and due to a lack of understanding our historical past, we will be quite dismissive that we're not this and we're not that because of the little tribal conflicts we have, et cetera. And I think this is the beauty with Islam, because what Islam says to us is that we should focus more on our faith and we should focus more on doing good with people as opposed to trying to attach ourselves to a clan or a tribe or, you know, where lineage is concerned or whatever the case may be. And I think that's a good starting point, you know. That's not to say that we should dismiss, you know, clans or tribes or anything like that, but it has very little relevance, you know, when it comes to spirituality. Because like what Ibn al-Jawzi said when he was speaking to those bunch of Abyssinians when he, when he wrote those books, that focus not so much on your appearance, etc., on your, you know, your, your, your mannerisms, you know, focus on your conduct, etc., because that is what is important in the eyes of Allah, not which tribe or clan you come from. So I can understand that, but we really need to educate ourselves on who we are and what we are. You know, and I think this is something, you know, in order to stop the contentious uh, conflicts that sometimes we have internally as well as externally. 
we had another question in the chat. Um, it was from Danny. You mentioned that some Muslims will have trouble naming five influential Muslims besides Bilal in history. What other influential black Muslims are they? I can name two that you've already told us, Ali and Jafar bin Abu Talib. Yeah, okay, I've heard about that. You could talk about, you know, Muhammad Ali, you could talk about Malcolm X, I could talk about the likes of Yusuf and Tashfin, um, we could talk about uh, the likes of, um, what you call it, trying to move out of the Sahab is now into other realms. Um, Al Jahid, you know, Viryab, you know, which I've already mentioned. You got other th people such as uh, Ibrahim Al Mahdi, the brother of Harun al Rashid. You know, we can talk about Bolay Ismail, okay, who was the Sultan of Morocco, and the list just goes on and on, you know. So there, there's many, many different people I can personally name. But this is the problem sometimes with Muslims that they only focus on one person, Bilal, you know, maybe Zaid, uh, and that's it, you know, Khalas, it's over, you know, let's just Washi, maybe, and that's it. We need to be more comprehensive than this. And this is why I made the foundation of looking at black as a skin color amongst Arabs. Because a lot of people like to think it's Africans, etc. No, they ventured and settled in Arabia. They maintained those colors because they needed it in the desert. You know, you have white skin in the day, you'd have burnt up, you'd have caught, you know, cancer at the time. So through Allah's mercy, etc. So skin colors it has an element of beautification. There's no doubt about that. But it, has, but it shouldn't be used by people in order to distort the reality of what skin color was really and truly for, in order to adapt and to adjust to the climatic changes that people are going to encounter through movement or through settlement. Any other questions or anyone wants to speak, feel free to raise your hand. I'll put it in the chat. You can see someone typing. Yeah. It's not working well, the teams today, is it? I'm out, unfortunately. <laughs> Okay. I guess then we might as well, um, if no one has anything else to say, we might as well come to a close. Um, thank you so much for coming today, Brother Abu Bakr. It's been very, very um, insightful. Thank um, you so much. I've listened to you, as I was saying, five times already, and every time I learn something new. Good. Um, and we'll always, you know, have you back. And, and yeah. I'm glad, you know, you, you've been on, on a wider platform now, a lot of a lot yes. more people are hearing your your topics and your conversations, um, which is quite brilliant. And people are saying thank you on, on the chat as well. Yeah, thank you very much. Thank you all of you that turned up, made the effort, etc. I know it's a little bit late, late at night, and most of you are tired, but thanks again. I'm tired. I did the best I could, unfortunately. <laughs> you know, Teams is not the best applications for you know, for watching or to operate, etc. especially in this situation. But thanks anyway for attending. I really appreciate that. Thanks, everyone. Thank you.